This is the CBS Evening News. Connie Chung reporting. Good evening. Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev will arrive in China in a few hours for the first Soviet-Chinese summit in 30 years. Gorbachev left Moscow this morning a day earlier than Westerners expected for a stop in the Siberian city of Irkutsk. The TASS news agency said he is resting there before flying on to Beijing. Dan Rather is with us live in Beijing tonight to begin our week-long coverage of Gorbachev's visit. Dan? Mikhail Gorbachev will be in China in just a few hours with Raisa Gorbachev for a summit meeting that marks a turning point for the whole communist world. This is a time of healing, the first Chinese-Soviet summit since 1959. But it's also a time of turmoil for both of the big communist governments. Gorbachev is desperately trying to make his economic reforms work. The Chinese, already ahead with economic reforms, are trying to deal with a mass student protest, these students demanding political reforms of the same kind that Gorbachev already has allowed with his glasnost in the Soviet Union. When dawn broke this morning here in Beijing, thousands of Chinese students were still gathered in Tiananmen Square, Gorbachev's first stop after he arrives. China's communist leaders had given the students an overnight deadline to end their protest, but they ignored it and police once again did not move against them. John Sheehan is our correspondent on the scene. The nearly 2,000 hunger-striking students and their supporters camped out in Tiananmen Square all night. At dawn, more arrived to join the protest, vowing that it will go on despite the arrival later today of Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev for the first Sino-Soviet summit conference in 30 years. Mr. Gorbachev, come here and we welcome him, and, but we don't forgive, uh, give up our, uh, say, our strike. All day, medical students dispensed glucose solution and vitamins. A few of the strikers were already weak from hunger and lack of sleep. The authorities offered a concession, a meeting with government officials. A brief clip was shown on national television. The students came out angry. The meeting, they said, was a fake meaningless talk from officials who have no real power. The demonstrators are demanding talks with high-level communist leaders and chanting live coverage because of distorted reports in the state-run media. More people, including many Chinese workers, arrived in the square, increasing the authorities' embarrassing dilemma. The students say they intend to move against the government the way the Chinese have always moved, step by step, in large numbers, until the obstacles give way. As a glee club entertained, city authorities announced that Tiananmen Square will be cleared of pedestrians before Gorbachev arrives. The impasse continues. In this historic struggle of wills between the pro-democracy students and the Communist Party of China, the test may be whether the students can again attract enough people to the square to make it impossible for the government to move against them without risking a bloodbath. John Sheehan, CBS News, Beijing. As Gorbachev sets out trying to normalize relations, trying for a new detente with China after 30 years, one thing he'll be looking for is an expanded trade agreement. China and the Soviets were big trading partners in the 1950s, but that trade relationship, along with some others, dried up and cooled off during the political feuding and the border tensions that followed. In the 1980s, it's been coming back slowly, as our Moscow correspondent Barry Peterson reports. The thaw on this windswept border began with Chinese watermelons in danger of rotting. The Chinese offered them to Soviet soldiers manning lonely outposts. Today, the border echoes with the rumble of trucks carrying Soviet goods in, bringing Chinese goods out. What passes through here is only a trickle in the economies of the two countries. But trade across this once closed border is one of Mikhail Gorbachev's themes for his visit to Beijing. When he gets here, he will encourage the Chinese to forget the differences, let the barriers fall, especially the trade barriers. The Russians are willing to sell, and the Chinese certainly are eager to buy. The problem is, the Russians don't have what the Chinese want. The Chinese these days do their window shopping from the West. Would she buy a Russian or a Japanese television? Japanese. And the car of his dreams, what country styling does he like? Okay. U.S. The Soviets helped China build its heavy industry three decades ago, and they want the contracts to modernize the factories. But the Chinese now prefer advanced technology from Japan or the United States. 
to the extent that the Chinese are preoccupied with their own domestic modernization, they very much need uh, Western uh, cooperation, particularly in the economic area. So the buying and selling between these countries will likely remain what it is today, said a Chinese official. They sell us low quality wood, we send them second class canned food. Our trade is basically selling to each other anything we can't sell to the rest of the world. Gary Peterson, CBS News, Beijing. All this week, Dan Rather will be anchoring the CBS Evening News from China with reports on the summit and the new face of communism. We'll be back with more news in a moment. A team of experts is preparing tonight to fly out to the aircraft carrier America to investigate the Navy's third fatal accident in less than a month. Two crewmen were killed. The America left Norfolk four days ago and is reportedly on alert to head for Panama at short notice. The accident happened last night off the coast of North Carolina. An explosion and fire in a fuel pump room. The 1,900 additional combat troops ordered to Panama by President Bush were getting used to their new surroundings today, and worshipers at Sunday church services throughout the country heard sharp criticism of dictator Manuel Noriega. Juan Vasquez reports. They read the letter from the pulpit of every Catholic church in Panama. We condemn the savage and cowardly beating of the civilian opposition, it said, and we appeal to the government to respect the will of the people. A special message was directed to the soldiers, the backbone of the Noriega regime. We ask you not to use your weapons against a people who are unarmed. The church claimed it had already become the target of intimidation from the regime and protested the way in which the home of Archbishop Marcos McGrath was surrounded by military and paramilitary forces when he met with opposition leaders a few days ago. Anti-Noriega candidates Ricardo Arias and Billy Ford were greeted as heroes at the masses. Ever since the assault and beating several days ago, they have avoided public demonstrations. Today, they went to as many locations as possible in an effort to rally support from within the safety of the church. It's a moral battle to the Panamanian people. They call the church statement new evidence of national support, but its impact may not be seen immediately. In a sense, the church is preaching to the converted. There is no sign that the armed forces will be swayed by what the church says, and even in this heavily Catholic country, sermons and pastoral letters are unlikely to change a government. Juan Vasquez, CBS News, Panama City. And that's an abbreviated version of our news. Tomorrow night and all next week, Dan Rather will be anchoring from China. Later tonight, Bill Plant will be here with the CBS Sunday Night News. I'm Connie Chung in New York. I'll see you again next Sunday night. Thank you for joining us and for all of us at CBS News. Happy Mother's Day. Our viewers know something that you don't? Chances are they do. Watch Kathleen Sullivan and Harry Smith weekdays on CBS This Morning. This is CBS.